my job to get them back. Yeah. Once I get them in the room, they usually stay. Yeah. <laughs> but it's just getting them in the room, getting them signed up. So. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's, the, that's the trick. So, and if I get to pay a couple hundred dollars to get some graduate credits to learn about it, great. Yeah. Hey. It's all fine with me. And find out what the new music is. Yeah. Yeah. I would have been the room. Do you want to take a quick course in a good book called uh, the Piano Shop at yeah. the Left Bank? Oh. We're talking about the book too. And it's about, all about pianos. And literally, almost, it's really a memoir, but it, it's all about it.
Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Pastor Ashley Osborne, and welcome to worship this Sunday at July 3rd with Valley of Peace Lutheran Church. And hey, for folks in here, thanks for sitting towards the front. Look at this. We can pat ourselves on the back, Lutherans. You are great. <laughs> Uh, Valley of Peace, as you know, is an ELCA congregation, as well as a Reconciling in Christ Church and a community committed to racial justice. We are guided by the words of Scripture, and we find our call from the prophet Micah, chapter 6, verse 8, which reads, What does the Lord require of you but to do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with your God? And so in our walk of faith at Valley of Peace, all are welcome to participate as we work for healing, justice, and peace, and as we proclaim the presence of God that moves in and through all people. So thank you today for your presence, your digital presence, your physical presence. Your presence truly does enrich our time of worship and enrich our community of faith. I want to just highlight a few announcements for you. You'll see them in the bulletin along with hymns. Everything is included for you this Sunday. One announcement is for worship today, especially for those online. This is a communion Sunday. It's the first Sunday of the month. So if you'd like to participate in communion, I ask that you have bread or crackers and wine or juice available. And I'll speak the words of distribution first to you and then we'll serve the whole congregation as well for communion. Also looking ahead, Vacation Bible School is coming up in early August, so if you know young people in your life who would like to come to Vacation Bible School, you don't have to be a member, please look at information for that. It's a full day of Vacation Bible School this year, so I think that's a great option for households. It's nine to four. So yeah, look at information if you have questions or want to register. Reach out to Emily Moravec, our Director of Children, Youth, and Family Ministries. And then, of course, as a congregation, one of the things that we do is continue to pray for one another. You'll always see many prayer concerns in the bulletin, so I invite you to take the bulletin home as a, as a guide for your own prayer life. We are continuing in the season of praying for 10 households every week. We've been doing this since the Sunday after Easter. And by the end of this month, every household at Valley of Peace will have been prayed for for one week. So thank you for your continued prayers. And feel free to reach out to those households to let them know you're praying for them. See if they have any prayer requests as well. We also have prayers for people with health concerns in the bulletin. I want to highlight one that is not included. I ask for your prayers for Jim Crowfoot. Jim Crowfoot is hospitalized in the ICU. He has an infection and is septic as well. So they're trying to figure out blood pressure and the source of the infection. So Angela, Jim's wife and their family, really appreciate your prayers of support for Jim's health right now. We also offer prayers for those who are grieving and you'll see in the bulletin we're praying for the Haynes family. Sherry Haynes died at the end of June and her funeral service is this Saturday, July 9th, here at Valley of Peace. So continued prayers for her husband Mike and their four children and their family as they mourn and remember and prepare to celebrate Sherry's life. And then not including the bulletin, but I'll also ask for prayers for John Larson. John Larson's dad, Glenn, died a week ago Friday. And so prayers for the Larson family as they, again, remember and celebrate the life of Glenn Larson as well. Our whole service is a service rooted in prayer and breath and being before God. And so I'm going to invite you to rise as you are able and join with me in the call to worship as printed in your bulletin. As we gather for worship, let us come to God in silence, offering our prayer in sighs and in our breath. So let us have a moment of silence to breathe prayers of praise and longing. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. 
God responds to the prayers of the destitute and will not reject their plea. I will give you the treasures of darkness and the riches hidden in the secret places. All creation groans in labor pains, and we groan too, awaiting the redemption of our bodies. For Jesus said, where two or three gather in my name, I am there among them. We are gathered together. Let us worship our God. Amen. Let us join together in singing our opening hymn, hymn number 807. <laughs> continues with our confession and forgiveness. Praise our wonderful maker who wove our bodies from the depths of the earth, hems us in, behind, and before, and will knit us back together. Amen. Amen. Jesus said, love God with all your heart, all your mind, and all your soul, and love your neighbor as yourself. But we have sinned in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another, saying, have mercy on us. Gracious God, we confess that we have turned from you and given ourselves to the power of sin. Have mercy on us. You call us into community, but we are scattered. Have mercy on us. You demand we care for the least of these, but we are swayed by wealth and power. Have mercy on us. You made us to live in harmony with creation, but we have failed. Have mercy on us. You invite us to follow Jesus, but we have lost our way. Have mercy on us. We are truly sorry. We repent and turn to you. Have mercy on us. Let us have a time of silence for personal reflection. Jesus said, The realm of God is like a woman baking bread. She adds a pinch of yeast to the flour, and the dough rises and grows in ways we never imagined. By this, ever-expanding grace. God forgives us and fills us with new life. 
we are free to love our neighbors as God first loved us. Alleluia. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, we thank you for the witness of Shifra and Pua, who disobeyed Pharaoh's orders in order to obey what you called them to do. Even today, as we, as disciples of Christ, are called to act, give us courage and strength to live as you would have us do, so that all people may flourish. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. I invite you to be seated. And I'm going to invite John Larson to come forward for our faith moment, knowing we're all children of God. So we're all here to learn from you today, John. <laughs> Thanks. I'm going to start with um, a little test of your sense of right and wrong. So I want you to raise your hand if, well, if I told you to take this baseball and find a window to throw it through, how many of you would do that? Raise your hand. <laughs> Online, anybody? Oh, okay. Is the window open? <laughs> <laughs> she asked if the window is open. <laughs> okay, uh, next. Okay, so pretend, for instance, that Pastor Ashley's having a bad day. She was out fishing before church, she usually does, and she had a big one on and it broke the line. How many of you would be extra special nice to Pastor Ashley today? <laughs> all right, I think we, both, we all have a pretty good sense of right and wrong. Um, in today's lesson, the Egyptian king demands that the Hebrew women do something really bad. And I'll let you hear the details of that in just a minute when the reading is read but, uh, for today. But the Hebrew women are really brave and they don't follow those orders. And I know that most of us, at some point, are going to be asked to do something we know is wrong. So what do we do? Now, for kids, it's uh, probably fine to listen to your parents and to your teachers. It's your friends I'm worried about. <laughs> when I was 16, I was driving a couple friends to play hockey, and one of them asked me, what can this car do? And it was a 1970 Plymouth Valiant, so the answer was not much. But what he was asking me to do was to drive really fast. And I knew that was the wrong thing to do, but they kept pestering me, and eventually I caved, floored it, got the car out of control, slid on some ice, right into a parked car. You hit a parked car, it's pretty much your fault. And, uh, <laughs> there was a lot of damage done, and we were very lucky not to get hurt. When I was teaching, I'd hear students say to one another, don't be playing with Jimmy today, or, or don't be friends with Sally. Stuff that we know is really mean. But it's kind of hard when it's your friends telling you to do that. So, some suggestions probably work for all of us, but maybe for kids. When your friends tell you to do things you know is wrong, first thing is to make sure that you listen to your instincts. You know what's right or wrong. And when you know what's right or wrong, it's a lot easier to stand firm. Uh, second, it's really helpful to have a friend with you, a friend you know is going to do the right thing. So choosing your friends is really a good idea, choosing good friends. And last, of course, you can always talk to someone you trust, an adult you trust. And they'll give you some good advice, make you feel better, help you for next time. All right, I have one last test. This one's a little grayer, so you don't have to raise your hand for this one. All right, I want you next week, next Sunday, to find your piggy bank or wherever you keep all your money. And I want you to bring it to church and give it all to me. <laughs> we'll just see how that one plays out <laughs> alright will you pray with me dear God guide us to know right from wrong and guide us in choosing good friends give us the courage to do what is right even when it may be difficult 
Amen. And our worship continues with our scripture reading for today. Today's reading is from Exodus 1, verses 8 through 21. Now a new king arose over Egypt who did not know Joseph. He said to his people, Look, the Israelite people are more numerous and more powerful than we. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them, or they will increase, and in the event of war, join our enemies and fight against us and escape from the land. Therefore, they set taskmasters over them to oppress them with forced labor. They built supply cities, Pithom and Ramesses, for Pharaoh. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and spread, so that the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites. The Egyptians subjected the Israelites to hard servitude and made their lives bitter with hard servitude in mortar and bricks and in every kind of field labor. They were ruthless in all the tasks that they imposed on them. The king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, one of whom was named Shipra and the other Puah, when you act as midwives to the Hebrew women and see them on the birth stool, if it is a son, kill him. But if it is a daughter, she shall live. But the midwives feared God. They did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them, but they let the boys live. So the king of Egypt summoned the midwives and said to them, Why have you done this and allowed the boys to live? The midwives said to the Pharaoh, Because the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women, for they are vigorous and give birth before the midwife comes to them. So God dealt well with the midwives, and the people multiplied and became very strong. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Steve, for reading. I want to take a moment before I preach because this is not the point of my sermon today, but I also want to acknowledge something that I heard in the text connected to our current day situation. When I heard the text about women fighting for children to live, I couldn't help but think of Roe versus Wade recently being overturned. And I've had a couple of folks reach out to ask more about the ELCA stance on this and on abortion. So I just want to take a moment to name that this text is not one that is lifting up pro-life. I want to acknowledge that the ELCA has done great work on a social statement specifically regarding abortion, which you can find on the ELCA website under their social statements. This came out in September 1991. In all of the social statements that the ELCA has done, they enter into the process of discernment faithfully turning to scripture, recognizing the diversity in the church as well. So I encourage you to look for that if you are curious on the ELCA's position after Roe versus Wade has been overturned. I will just highlight that part of what our church believes is that abortion is a tragic issue and that we as disciples of Christ and in the ELCA work to make sure that abortions are safe, legal, and rare. And that comes right out of the social statement. So I ask that we just hold that, name that, as we approach this text today. Will you please pray with me? God, open us up to your word, your word which passes faithfully from our ears to our hearts and from our hearts to our lives. Amen. There is a lot of fear in this text today. We really have probably three main characters that we hear from. We have the new king of Egypt, as well as the two midwives. And just a side note, I do always find it interesting who is named in scripture. We don't know the name of the current king, though he is much more powerful in that time than the midwives who are named, Shifra and Pua. But all three of them in this text are really described as having fear. Having fear. The king is described as being afraid of the Egyptians. 
He is afraid because the Egyptians are increasing in their numbers. He's afraid that they're going to increase in their might and their power. And he is afraid that the power that he has will be taken away from him. His fear is protecting himself. And so in protecting himself, he really becomes a tyrant and tears down, literally kills and destroys the life of others to protect his own power. And then we have the fear of the midwives. We are told that they disobey the command of this king because of their fear of the Lord. Their fear of the Lord. This is language that we often hear about in scripture. We've heard other faithful people in scripture described as having fear of the Lord, but it's not language that I think we use often in church. So as we approach again what we can learn from these midwives today as we continue in this season of praying through scripture and hearing these stories in really, of people in relationship with God and learning what we can do to continue to connect with God, I want to understand a little bit more about what it means to have fear in the Lord. And in particular, I want to read a paragraph from Cole Arthur Riley, This Here Flesh. She has a whole chapter related to fear, and she talks a little bit more about what fear has looked like in her faith life. But she, in particular, names the fear of the Lord that these midwives have today. So I want to spend just a moment to read this paragraph. Riley says, One of the many, or excuse me, of the many unsung heroines in the Bible, I am drawn to the story of Shifra and Pua. They were Hebrew midwives whom Pharaoh ordered to kill every male Hebrew baby at birth. In holy defiance, they delivered every child safely, and when confronted by their tyrant, they looked him in the eye and lied to his face. Hebrew women are strong, they told him. They give birth before we can get to them. Their rebellion is a model for our liberation today. Perhaps to fear God is to refuse to submit to the demagogues of this world, to refuse to grant them the power they crave, and to place our waiting in the hand of God, who won't manipulate and wield our fears against us, but will hold them in tenderness. To fear God is to have nothing else to fear here on earth. To place our fear in God is to mean that we do not fear anything else here around us, just like the midwives. They had fear and trust in God, and so it wiped away their fear of this king. It wiped away their fear of what could happen, and they had a lot to fear, friends. They could have lost their life. But their fear in God was stronger than the fears of the world, than the fears of those in power, than the fears of what could happen to them. And so as I was approaching this text and thinking about what the fear of the Lord looks like in our lifetime, and knowing we're a little bit more intimate this morning, and for those online, type in comments as well. I am wondering, can you help me think of people in our lifetime both living or currently, or deceased or currently living, people who feared the Lord more than they feared power around them. And and you can shout them out if you feel comfortable or tap your neighbor and they can shout it out for you. Martin Luther King, King. yep, that was one I thought of as well. Bonhoeffer. Bonhoeffer, yes, thank you. Others? Jimmy Carter, thank you. Yeah. Kind of gets harder and harder to name contemporary names, doesn't it? <laughs> A little bit. What about, and you don't have to share this out loud, but who are people in your life who spoke out? So maybe it's a colleague or a family member or a friend. Is there someone who's fear in God inspired your faith in God? And I'm just going to give you a minute to think about that. You can share it out loud if you want, but also do not feel like you need to either. I was thinking about how this is one of those sermons that sort of sounds really nice, but it's hard to live out 
It's hard to sort of set aside our fears of the world and know that all of our fear is in God alone. And I'm going to keep using that language since that's in scripture. But again, when I talk about the fear of God, I really talk about as all of our trust, all of our hope, all of our faith being placed in God, not in the world or the powers of the world around us. But I'm going to keep using the language fear of the God, or fear of God, just as the midwives did. Because to put our fear in God and nothing else sounds like a lovely saying, but it is really hard to live out. And so as I thought of people too, like Jimmy Carter or Martin Luther King or Bonhoeffer or people in my own life, pastors and friends who are strong advocates and speak out, I wondered what fosters that fear of God in them? Because I think part of our work as people of faith is not all of our names will be well known or recognized or put in scripture, well of course not put in scripture, but won't be named in the same ways as Shifra and Pua in our work, but we are all called to be advocates and to reveal our fear in God more than the fear of the world. And so I think about John, exactly what you said. How can we surround ourselves with people and prayer and practices that help our fear in God deepen so that we can be advocates for God's life, God's love to be known. Because that's exactly what Shifra and Pua did. Their fear was so grounded in God that what they worked for was life, literal life and freedom for the children being born. But because of their acts, which in some ways were pretty defiant, but pretty small as well, because of their acts, Moses would eventually be born of an Egyptian woman, Mo, or of an Israelite woman, excuse me, Moses would rescue the Israelites from the Egyptians. Moses would hand down the commandments. Moses would proclaim God's love and God's life because of the acts of these two named women who feared God. So how does the fear of God shape our lives and how do we ground ourselves in this fear of God? And I think it's really similar to what John shared as well. I see a few characteristics. The first is that we know the story and the liberation of our God. We are familiar enough with stories in scripture and we ground ourselves in the stories of scripture to know what it means to trust in God and to know what God is doing in our lives. We know, just as I proclaim every Sunday, we believe in a God who works for healing, justice, and peace. We know that we believe in a God where the high are brought low and the low are brought high. Those who have been had all of their power taken away, God raises them up. We believe in a God whose kingdom keeps expanding to become even more and more inclusive and accessible so that all people can participate. We believe in an open communion table that we will celebrate today. And the midwives knew that about God. They knew that God was not a God of death and of taking away even more power from the powerlessness. They knew that God is a God who liberates those who are enslaved. And so as we work as disciples of faith, we have to know these stories of God so that when we are called upon, we know how God acts in our world. We know that when we have the fear of God, we believe in a God who is expansive and liberating for all people. And in fact, I think this is, again, harder, easier said than done, harder to do. We've seen this in churches. It's why we have so many denominations, right? Even me pointing to the communion table and saying that that's a welcome table for all people, no matter what, that's not true in every church. Me standing up here and preaching would not be true in every church. And so as a church, we need to stand firm in our fear of God, knowing, knowing the liberation and the expansive welcome that God proclaims. And that starts by reading about God in scripture, because I am sure Shifra and Pua, these midwives, knew the stories of God. I also, again, exactly what John said, they had one another. We need people in our lives who help us discern between the fear of God and the fear of the world. We need people in our lives who can hold us accountable to the ways we ground ourselves trusting in God, helping us to discern best steps forward so that God's love is proclaimed. 
It's one of the reasons we worship together week after week. It's one of the reasons we have small groups and Bible studies. It's why we pray for one another and pray for the households. But even more than that, exactly what John said, it is having good friends. It is having friends who can pray for and with you. It is having friends who can keep you accountable. It is, for me, a spiritual director and a clergy coach and at times a therapist and other pastoral colleagues. We need a community. Shifra and Pua had each other to remind themselves of the trust and the fear of God that they held and the ways they called one another to that work. So we need to know the stories of God. We need to have a community of faith. And, and I think this might be the most important, we have to have hope in what God is doing and going to do. I don't know if Shifra and Pua lived long enough to see Moses be born. I don't think they lived long enough to see the Israelites freed from slavery. And yet their actions were not just about their own lifetime, it was what God was doing in the future. We have to have hope enough that even if we don't see God's liberating act in our lifetime, we know that God is constantly at work resurrecting and liberating God's people, and we play a part in that proclamation. And so we look ahead, knowing that we are planting seeds or tending to the lives of people where we may not see what grows or blossoms in their life, but trusting in God. This is a little bit different take on this, but when I was thinking about what keeps me grounded in the fear of the Lord, I was thinking about that timing that it's not about our timing, it's about God's timing. And I will just share that one thing that has worked for me is if I'm able, I give myself 48 hours when there is a situation that grieves me or frustrates me or that I sort of need to double check my action or my priorities on, if I can take 48 hours, that time is the time for me to be reminded of God's presence, God's call, God's work in my life, often in conversations with others and in conversation with scripture. And so finding ways to remind ourselves that it is about God's work. And friends, this is not easy work. As we read of Shifra and Pua today, I imagine you to think of yourselves also as midwives. What is the work that you are grounding yourselves in so that the fear of God so lives in you that you can continue to speak out for those who have no voice, that you can continue to work for healing, justice, and peace, and that you can know the love and life of God that grounds you. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let us join together in singing our hymn of the day.
united in Christ and guided by the Spirit, we pray for the church, the creation, and all in need. Lord of the harvest, send your church into the world to proclaim, proclaim Christ's new creation to all. Renew the church as it carries out your mission of peace and healing. Today we pray for missionaries who accompany your people. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Your creation abounds with flowing waters and diverse creatures. Guide the work of climate scientists as they develop and advocate ways to restore Earth's natural balance. Motivate all mankind to adopt lifestyles that protect and sustain the Earth. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, you guard the nations. Let no leaders exalt themselves, but lift up the most vulnerable and work for the good of all. Send your spirit to eradicate classism, inequity, violence, war, poverty, and hunger. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. You desire abundant life for all your creation, Lord. As we celebrate Independence Day, install in us gratitude, generosity, and persistence in working towards freedom for all people. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Creating God, you care for all in need. Nourish those who are hungry. Restore employment to those who have lost work. Heal those who are sick. And comfort all who are dying or grieving. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We remember the saints who proclaimed your reign on earth and now rest in you. Especially today, we remember Sherry Haynes and Daryl Slindy. Make us faithful in our witness to Christ's new creation. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of every time and place, in Jesus' name and filled with the Holy Spirit, we entrust these spoken prayers and those in our hearts to your holy keeping. Amen. In this season, we are not passing offering plates during worship, but we do pause in worship to remember the gifts that God has given us in the ways we are called to steward those gifts, gifts of time and talents and treasures. So thank you for the many ways your gifts proclaim the love and life of God in this church, in your families and households, and in this community and world. If you are able to give a financial gift in this time, you'll see in the bulletin a few ways you can do that, including text to give or online giving as well. We also have offering baskets as you leave the sanctuary or you can mail in your offering. I'd like us still in worship to take just a brief time of reflection for you to think about the ways God is calling you to use your gifts. And then I'm going to close us in prayer with the words we just sang as a calling for God in our lives. So let us have a time for silence and reflection. Here I am, Lord. Is it I, Lord? I have heard you calling in the night. I will go, Lord, if you lead me. I will hold your people in my heart. Amen. I invite you to rise as you are able as our service continues with communion. God is here. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to our God. Let us give thanks to the Holy One and Holy Three. It is right to give our thanks and praise. Now we give thanks for all we have received through the life, death, and resurrection of our Savior Jesus Christ. With all heaven and earth, we shout with joy. Holy, holy, holy God, God of power, God of might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of our God. Hosanna in the highest. All thanks and praise are yours, O God, for in Christ you became incarnate in a human body. 
By your flesh we are freed from sin, death, and all that holds us captive. You have been revealed to us as the one who breathes, and you breathe into us new life. With the prophet Ezekiel, we cry out, In the night in which Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And again, after supper, he took the cup, and after giving thanks, he gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Do this for the remembrance of me. Groaning in expectation with all of creation, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Breath of God, in this bread and in this cup, you bring new life to your church. Breathe on us that we may live. May your spirit intercede for us with sighs too deep for words, so that we might be made one body in Christ. Breathe on us that we may live. Revive our faith, infuse us with your peace, and reveal to us your justice, so that we might witness to the resurrection in all that we say and in all that we do. Breathe on us that we may live. All thanks and praise to you, O God, Holy One and Holy Three. Amen. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Wisdom has prepared the food, poured the wine, and set her table. She calls, come, all are welcome to eat and drink. And so all are welcome to receive communion, both gathered digitally online and physically here in person. Ushers will invite you forward, starting with the back pew, so the last will come up first. You'll receive a cup, which includes a gluten-free wafer and grape juice. And then when you return to your pew, you're invited to take and eat right as you sit in your pew. So I invite you to be seated, and I'll offer the words of distribution first to those online. To our online worshipers, this is the body of Christ given for you, and this is the blood of Christ shed for you. Amen.
Please rise as you are able. And now may the body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in God's grace. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. May the blessing of our wonderful maker, who wove your body in the depth of the earth, hems you in, behind and before, and will knit you back together, be with you today and every day. Amen. And before we receive the blessing of our Lord, just a note, we have some cupcakes and other food available as well. So stop for a treat on your way out of worship. And now may you receive the blessing of our Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you God's everlasting and almighty peace. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God, Mother of us all. Amen. Amen. Let us join together in singing our sending hymn. to share the news, abundant life for all. Go in peace, be moved by the Spirit. Thanks be to God. Amen.